to the shopping malls this morning, you have come to listen to the Dharma. Actually, listening to the Dharma is the single most important gift that you can give yourself. For there is no other greater, greater endeavor in life than to journey into your own mind. So today's topic is journeying into your own mind. So um, I must say that I'm very, uh, it's really heartwarming to see that you are here. You made the effort to come. And that itself is already very, very, uh, very, very important. It's the first step towards understanding your own mind. So, um, can you hear me from the at the back? Because my voice is actually quite soft. Um, and uh, is it better now? Uh, when I b make it a little bit higher, is it better? Okay. So, I would like to uh, thank uh, BGF for giving me the opportunity to uh, share the Dharma with you this morning. It's a... Uh, it's a very important topic, I would say, so journeying into it, in journeying into the mind, yeah. So, um, how many of us actually meditate? May I know? How many of us practice meditation? Mm, who has never meditated before? Please be honest. It's okay. Doesn't matter. Yeah. So everybody has more or less attended some sort of a formal meditation training, right? So exactly, what are we training? When we say we are actually going, uh, yeah, so for meditation, what, what is meditation? To calm the mind, okay. What is the single purpose of meditation? The most important reason why we should meditate. To liberate ourselves from? From what? Why? When we meditate, we must understand why we are doing this meditation. This thing that we call meditation, that the word itself sometimes is quite intimidating, isn't it, for some people? Yeah. So when we mention meditation, there is an idea that the meditation is something supernatural, uh, out of this world, difficult. What else? What other? What is? What other adjectives come to mind actually when you think about meditation? Rigorous, rigid, maybe. Can can anybody else tell me? Just think of one thing that you can understand about meditation. Just one. Very good. What else? Who else? Two. Purify the mind. Okay. So. Yes, sister. Battleground. Okay. So that is, I like sister's description because it's exactly the same as my mind. It's a battleground all the time. It's like having a warfare inside the mind, you know. So how many of us feel that, you know, every day you're walking into a, a war zone? The moment you get up, the, the, you're confronted with a thousand thoughts. All the time, all the time thinking, all the time something is going on inside here. All the time chatting, the mind is never stopping. It hops from one object to another object to another object to another object, never stopping from birth till death, just continuously talking, 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 and then grasping at things, you know. How many of us actually feel that our days are perfect, pure, so calm, that the moment we wake up in the morning, it's like somebody has thrown some flowers, and then we're just walking into the day beautifully. Does it actually happen that way? Is it, you know, like the dewas are showering the flowers and then everything is like beautiful for you. You're just walking into the day with the, you know, everything is peaceful. Or is it like, you know, some sort of like a battlefield, you know, like or, or walking on thorns every day. Walking on thorns, isn't it? Life is not easy. Life is a battle, actually. Only if you think that it's a battle, then it becomes a battle. So, with this, I would like you to just, before you listen to the Dharma, 
Just think of the purpose. Why actually you are here today? You are here today to listen to some little bit of uh, wisdom from the Buddha. It's not from me. It's from our teacher, the historical Buddha Shakyamuni, who has actually given this very important gift of the Dharma. And today my job is just to remind you. So please uh, keep your back straight. And I would like you to set this motivation that I'm going to listen to this Holy Dharma, the precious teachings of the Buddha, not for myself alone, but for the benefit of all. Because just as my mind is disturbed, or my mind is seeking for some seeking for happiness, everyone else in this world is seeking for happiness. Regardless of whether they are in the human realm, whether they are in the animal realm, whether they are pretas, whether they are hungry, I mean, whether they are hell beings, asuras, devas, any kind of life form, everybody wants to be happy. But everybody is doing things that make them unhappy, and they don't know that they are doing things that make them unhappy. So that's why we are going to listen to the Dharma today, so that we will be able to first cultivate our own minds, and then we can enlighten other people and other beings. So never practice the Dharma only for one's own gain. That, that the benefit that you receive from practicing the Dharma is very small. If you practice the Dharma for the benefit of every living being, then your motivation becomes so vast and that time you feel your heart opening widely. It becomes so spacious, your, your heart opens up. That is the reason why you should meditate and whatever dharma activity that you do, you have to think that you're doing it for others. The moment you think about yourself, your heart constricts. But the moment you think that you're doing it for others, your heart opens up like a lotus flower. So you can see the difference. Because mind training, the dharma is actually an experiment, it's a laboratory. The Buddha did not teach us anything to just believe and just, you know, blindly uh, just take whatever that the Buddha says without experiencing it. We have to experiment in the laboratory of our mind. So without experiencing it for our own selves, it is impossible for us to teach others or to tell others. So we must understand what is the difference when we meditate only for our own self and what is the difference when we meditate when it comes to others' welfare. Everyone wants happiness. So with this, I will do a short invocation and then we will begin our Dharma sharing. Sangi Chwe Da Han Sukhi Chok Nam La Jang Chu Bar Du Dag Ni Chab Su Chi Dagi Dagi jin so gi be shu nam gi Dro la pen jir sang gi dro par shu Sang gi chwe da han so gi chok nam la Jang chu bar du dag ni chap su chi Dagi jin so gi be shu nam ki Dro la pe chir sang ki dro par shu Until the heart of enlightenment is reached, I go for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. From the merit accrued by practicing giving and other perfections, may I become a fully enlightened being a Buddha to benefit numberless sentient beings. Until my purified and perfect state, I take refuge in the Triple Gem, the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. By the merits gained from listening to the Dharma, 
May I be free from afflictions and may I completely purify my mind and be liberated from this cycle of samsara. Simchen tamche dewa tan deve judan tempara juje dunga dan dunge gi judan devara juje dunge me pe dewa da pa da me devara juje nyering chadan ni dan da ve tan nyom chen po la ne para juru je simchen tamche dewa dan deve judan tempara juje dunga dan dunge gi judan devara juje dunge me pe dewa da pa da me devara juje nyering chadan ni dan da ve tan nyom chen po la ne para juru je May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings never be separated from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all beings be equanimous, free from the extremes of attachment and aversion. Semche namgi sambada lue jidra jidra waje jun thumon tekpa yi chiki kolo koto so. So, with the motivation that we are going to listen to the Dharma for the benefit of all sentient beings, so now we will begin our actual Dharma sharing. So, uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, how do you understand mind? We talk about mind all the time. What is mind? Is it the brain? Where is the mind? The thinking faculty, that's the mind? Okay, what else? What is mind? Now, how, how many of us uh, have studied Abhidharma? Uh, how many of us have uh, gone to any kind of a formal Buddhist study where we discover what is the mind through study? Okay, it doesn't matter because even if you study a hundred books, if you never meditate a single day, you will never understand your mind. You can study as much as you want, but the mind will never let you go. You will, it's such a powerful thing. The mind is always controlling you. But who is you? And who is the mind? What is controlling you? And who are you? Have you ever thought that when you are thinking that there's something else behind you that is controlling you, you can you feel it? Do you feel that there is this presence, something that is lurking around the corner in the dark recesses of your being? Isn't it? Something is there that is actually controlling you. What is this controlling factor? Are we aware of what we are doing? When we do something, how many of us are aware? When I'm eating, I'm aware that I'm eating. When I'm breathing, I'm aware that I'm breathing. How many of us are aware? Okay, very simple. When you wake up in the morning, what, what do you do? First thing, jump from the bed and straight away run to the toilet and or washroom and brush your teeth, right? Now, how many of you actually know that you're brushing your teeth? Come on, tell me. Is it in automatic mode? You do it autom remote control? Now, who has that remote control? Who is pressing that remote control every day that every morning, certain time, zoom, you just run to the washroom and you sit on the bowl, uh, you do your business, whatever, and then you brush your teeth or whatever that you do. You bathe and then you dress up and then you eat and then you run to your car and then you start it and then you run to work and then you do your work and then you go for lunch and then you do your work again and then you start your car again and you go back and then after that you eat again and then after that you brush your teeth again and then you go to sleep and then which, at which point are you actually aware? What is this awareness? Subconscious mind. If your awareness is in the subconscious mind, that means in your conscious mind, you are not aware. So that is actually very honest of you. Thank you so much. It's correct. We are not aware. The subconscious mind is not aware. The conscious mind is not aware. 
In order for the subconscious mind to be aware, it has to start with your conscious mind. Your conscious mind has to be aware. So that, have you ever heard of this word called mindfulness? So now we Buddhists like to talk a lot about mindfulness. It's our pride and joy that we, we actually own the patent to mindfulness, isn't it? It's actually this intellectual property rights of mindfulness and meditation belongs to Buddhists. That's what we think, isn't it? But what does mindfulness actually mean? Many questions today. I'm just going to ask you questions. You answer me and finish 11.30, I go back home. <laughs> Easy, yeah? So you just have to answer my questions. See how, how we can help each other. Sorry? Mindfulness is awareness, is it? Sati, sati. Aware of what you're doing daily or nay? Daily or moment to moment? Moment to moment. Present moment awareness. So now you, you know, whatever that you have learned is slowly coming back to you, isn't it? But uh, whatever that you learn, do you apply it every day? When you wake up in the morning, when you walk, can you feel the earth when you walk? When the wind blows, do you feel it on your skin? Do you feel, do you, do you live that moment? Can you really live in this moment? Or you're always thinking about the future? Or you're always worried about the past? So let me give you a scenario. When you go to, let's say for example, for a walk in nature, what do you do? Do you walk? Do you feel your feet on the ground walking? Do you actually really feel that step by step you're alive? Can you, do you feel it or you just walk? You just walk automatically because you need to do something. There's always something to be done. You always need to, to finish it on time. So when you come out of your car, you go for your walk, do you actually really live or you just remote control, you just walk? And then you, after that, you say, okay, it's time for me to go and do something else. Is it always something else, something else, something else? And then you never live. So if a bird comes, a beautiful bird comes, and then your mind is thinking about your job, can you enjoy the bird? Have you, do you see the birds in your house? Do you know that in your, in the birds come to your house every morning? Can you recognize the sound? Can you tell the difference between which bird's sound is, belongs to which bird? Which sound belongs to which bird? Do you, do you know? Can you hear? How often do you hear the birds? Every, every day you hear. Or is it sometimes you notice, most of the time you don't notice that the birds are there? Do you notice? Do you look out the window and see the sky? Do you? Now after the haze, yes, we look out the window because we, whenever we, we miss, something is taken away from us, then we, we miss the haze. I mean, not the haze, we miss the, the blue skies. How many of us can actually look at the sky and just sit down for a while and just absorb our mind into the sky? How many of us do that? Sometimes, yeah? Why not most of the time? Or why not all the time? Do you know that we can actually experience all these bird sounds, un enjoy the sky, and, and at the same time be productive? It's not that you need to stop doing your productive, stop being productive in order to enjoy the moment. Do you know that you can actually do two in one? In fact, actually speaking, if you can really live in the moment, you're, you're doing everything in one, one go. I, I'm not talking about multitasking. I'm talking about awareness. So when you're aware of the greenery, and do you see the, the greens in your, in your place, in your home? And do you, can you see the different shades of the green? When you look at a tree, when you look at a plant, what do you look at? Do you just look at the, the it's, it's there, it's green, I like it, it gives oxygen, or you actually can see the tones? Do you have time to see the tones? Do you have time to talk to the plant? Do you have time to enjoy the flowers? Do you have time to enjoy the smell of the flowers? Do you have time to live? Do you have time? Mm-hmm. You don't have time. Why? Why? Why does that happen? But after meditation, after how long you forget again? 
But after that, how many hours does the effect last? So even if we meditate every day, the effect doesn't last. It doesn't last. So, we, so that means meditation is not sitting on the cushion. That is not meditation. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you that meditation is living every moment in awareness. Every moment is a present moment in awareness. If we can live every moment, then we are truly alive. Otherwise, we are just like corpses and like rotting carcasses, just walking and doing our things. And then at the end of, the, at the end of our lives, we just drop dead and that's it, finish. And then we come back again, recycle. Do we want to become recycled for the next life, repackaged in a different body, come back again and, and suffer again and go through everything again? Do you want to go to school again? Do you want to go to school, be born again? Do you want to stay nine months in your mother's womb again? Do you know how it feels like the text tell us, can you remember how it was when you were in your mother's womb? It is actually a very stinky and filthy place. Isn't it? No doubt that it is our mom's womb, but it's actually the worst place in the world to be. It's in terms of filth, in terms of discomfort. And then when we are born, it's even worse. The moment that we are born, it's like a billion needles are pricking our skin. Because we are actually separated from our mom's womb. And then we are, when, when some, then the doc doctor touches us, it's actually very painful. The skin is very raw for a baby. When an infant comes out from the mom's womb, the skin is very raw and the child screams. Obviously, it screams for oxygen. That's the first thing, right? But there's another reason why the child screams is because it's so painful. No one has ever actually touched the child before. The child was always like this. And then now the child has lost that contact with the mom. And now the child has come, come out. Everything is different. Do we really want to go through it again and again? Going to school? Do, who, how many of us fancy going back to school? going back to work. Now, let's say if you're retired at 60, and then if you come back again next life, you have to start again and you have to work another 40 years. How many of you would like to do that again and again and again? And never ending. And that's not... And how many of us will be reborn as human beings? Or maybe we will be reborn immediately after this life. Maybe after we go out from here, we leave this place, we might get hit by something and then we might just die. We might be, and the very next moment, where will, we, where will we be reborn? Can we decide where we want to be reborn? Can we dictate the terms? The answer is yes, if you are aware. If you are, if you, you can see your own mind. If you are aware, you can decide where you want to be reborn. But if you are not aware, then you are just reborn according to your karma. The karma, the winds of karma will push you. So when I talk about awareness, I'm talking about 100% awareness all the time and never creating a single negative karma as you go along. And if you have that much of, that much of merit, then yes, the next life you can decide where you want to go. You can go. If you really have a lot of compassion, you, you can purposely be reborn in hell to save one being. If you have that much of compassion, you can actually purposely be uh, reborn in a uh, human realm to help others. If we have awareness, but most of us are living in, in remote control mode. So what happens to us after death? Immediately we are, some say 49 days, some say immediately. But let's just say, okay, we are reborn immediately. Let's just say. So where will, we be? where will we take birth? It's according to our karma, isn't it? If we have a lot of anger, where will we be reborn? If we are always angry, where will we be reborn? In the, in the hell realm. In the hell. Naraka, hell. So if we are too greedy and too attached, too attached to our money, too attached to our loved ones, where will we be reborn? We will be reborn according to, to the Buddha. It's not according to me. I'm just saying what the Buddha stated. We will be reborn in the hungry ghost realm, as pretas. If we are dull, our faculties are dull, we're lazy, 
you know, we, we don't use our brains much. I mean, we like don't really cultivate our minds. We are very dull. Where will we be reborn? Animal realm. And if you're always jealous, all the time jealous, where will we be, be reborn? In the Asura realm. You know, Suras are the Devas. Asuras are those who are lower than the Devas, always fighting, quarreling. We are quarreling all the time because we have this force of jealousy. The last thought of our mind when we die is going to be the deciding factor of where we are going to be reborn. So then, did I miss anything? Human realm. Ah, human realm. So how do we come back to the human realm? If we are always having a lot of this, uh, what they call that, if we are always thinking about doing something, doing something, we want to do something, always engage in business, the force of doing things, oh, never able to sit in one place, always wanting to do something, that kind of energy brings us back to the human realm also. Cannot sit still one, must always want to do something. If you, are, you just can't sit for two minutes, just in peace, you have to do something. So that's why in Tibetan, they say, uh, my teachers say, that in Tibetan, uh, the name for sentient beings is actually Drova Semchen. Yes, sister? Drova Semchen means beings that are always moving. That is how we describe sentient beings. We are always on the move. That's why we are always moving in the cycle of samsara, always moving from one birth to another, to another, to another, to another, moving and moving and circulating and circulating and never stopping. So that the Buddha said, stop. This can be your last birth if you stop. Stop, just stop. Whatever you're doing, we, just check your mind every day. Whether you have the tendency to want to get up, you always have to do something. You always have to pick up your phone. You always have to do something. Pick up your phone. You always have to do something. You always have to drive. You, you need to drive somewhere. You need to eat something. Always have to do something. How many of us can sit still and just enjoy? Two minutes only. Just two minutes. Mm. And then after that, the third minute, we want to run away already. Ah, uh, that, exactly. That is the condition of the human mind. That is the human mind. The human mind is conditioned to actually think that we need to do something. Actually, the Buddha said, if you want to be liberated from your mind, from this time, why we have to be liberated from our mind, our own negative mind, is because it controls us and it compels us to do things all the time. We, we must always occupy our minds all the time like monkeys, jumping from t handphone to food to whatever, to talking, to TV, to newspaper, to work. You know, we can't relax. And that is the curse of the humankind. We can't relax. We just cannot. So what to do? What can we do? So do we actually really know why we are like that? Why are we always running? And what are we running from? We are migrating beings. That's why they say Drova Simchen. We are always on the move. We are always moving, moving, moving. Our if you check, your body may be still, but your mind is always moving. Even if you're not actively taking the handphone or if you're not actively talking your mind is always talking 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 and we will die talking and even the, the, the minute that we die the second that we die that talking mind goes to the next one and it will talk again in the next life talk talk so the last thing that we thought the last thing that was talked by our minds to ourselves that is the next rebirth if your mind is telling you at the time of death I miss my family. Okay, then, and that depends on how strong you miss your family. If you miss them so much, then you become a preta. And you will be hovering around the house of, or your property. You, you get what I mean? So we, our minds are so powerful. So that's why, that is why the Buddha said we have to tame our minds. We have to tame our minds through meditation. So now, what is meditation? Meditation is None other than mind training. It's a habituation. Now we are so programmed to always want to do something, always want to think something. 
always chatting, chatting and never stopping. Meditation is teaching you how to stop. Just stop. Stop it. Calm down and stop. Give yourself a break. Just relax. Stop. So when you go, when you go somewhere to, to relax with your family, everybody will take out the handphone already. Nobody is actually talking to one another. Dinner, table, everybody is on the handphone. Always the, the fingers are tick, 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 tick. Always. And then if we are sitting, to, if we are at, uh, for example, at a natural place, we are always compelled to take photos on. We can never enjoy the trees without taking out our handphone and starting to take picture of the, of the trees. And then we don't even look at the pictures also. When we go back home, we, the picture just lies in the, in the camera. That's it. At the most, we will put it in Facebook. But do you know what happens when you actually take the picture on Facebook uh, or on your, in your phone? There is something that you are robbing yourself of. You are you're, you're robbing yourself of your life. I'm not saying that we cannot do it. Sometimes very beautiful, we take also, we take pictures. But if you are always taking pictures, always taking, always looking at life from the camera, then when are we going to live? If you are always going to look at life in the computer, when are we going to live? If you are always going to do something the next moment, we always have something planned the next moment. I have no time to enjoy the sky because I have something an, an appointment in five minutes. When are we going to live? So some people ask me, so I don't need to go to work lah because I need to live. My answer would be live and work at the same time. When you work, you be alive. How to do that? How to be alive and at the same time work? How can these two things, com conflicting things actually, be, how can we balance? Awareness. So now today I'm going to share with you how we can actually really balance. But first we need to know what is mind. So first, I want you to relax for two minutes. Just relax. Your body straight. Just relax. Close your eyes. Put a smile on your face. And then just watch your mind. If you don't know what is mind, just keep quiet and just watch whatever that is happening in your thoughts. It's like a TV program. We are good at watching TV, isn't it? And every single second, the TV, the images will change. So you look at your own mind and see whether the image change, changes or not. Is it always the same thing you're thinking? Is it the same mental image or different mental image? What do you see in your own mind? What do you hear? Is your mind talking to you? Do you hear voices? What do you feel? Do you feel tired? Do you feel pain? Is your body telling you something? And is your mind translating the pain and making it worse? What's happening? What is happening in your mind at this moment? Where is the mind? Where is the mind? Now try to find that mind. Can you touch that mind? If you know that you are talking, your mind is talking, and if you can see some mental image, can you touch it? Is there a color? Is there a shape? Can you hold it? Can you taste your mind? Can you see any can you see the mind? Can you describe your mind? What is the mind? What is it? 
Where is the mind? Is it in your head? Is it in your brain? Is your mind in your brain? Is it in your heart? Where is the mind? Is it in your stomach? What is going on now? So many thoughts? Are you thinking about the past? Is your mind somewhere back? Five minutes ago? Five years ago? Ten years ago? Is there some incident in your life that you cannot forget and you're still grasping? You're still holding on to it? The moment you close your eyes, you cannot forget the past? Is, this, is there something? Or is there some worry in the future that after this, you have to go somewhere? Or maybe now something is happening and you're worried that you need to, you need to look at your phone but you cannot because I'm stopping you? <laughs> because you're meditating now, so you cannot look at the phone, right? But your mind wants to look at it so badly. Give me the phone. I want it now. I want to think about the future. I need, I'm hungry. I'm sad. What is going on in your mind? Think. Don't think, just observe. Your job now is just to observe like somebody watching a TV. The TV of your own mind. You just sit back, enjoy and relax and see what is playing on your mind screen. Just enjoy, just try to see. And then you tell me whether you can, you can, you, you can touch, can you touch your mind? Can you, f you can feel your mind, right? Can you touch it? Is there a color? Is there a shape? Where does the mind come from? Who created this mind? Did somebody create the mind? Or did you create your own mind? And if you created your own mind, when did your mind start? One million years ago? One billion years ago? Yesterday? When you were born? When did your mind come into this world? When? When did your mind come? Is it the day that you were born? Or the day that you were conceived in your mother's womb? How many times have you come into this world? Do you know? And where is it? This, is this the same mind, this life? Or is it different? Last, ma last life and this life, is the mind the same? Is it different? Yesterday, is it the same? Is it different? Now, just now, before you meditated and now, has your mind changed? Is it the same? Is it different? And look at your mind. Just look at your thoughts and feel the feelings in your mind. Feel your body, the feelings. And then you see whether you like something or you don't like something. Do you feel that your mind is... If I tell you that your mind is doing four things, will you believe me? Will you believe that your mind is always doing only four things? And that is why you, you, we are suffering. We are suffering only because of these four things. If we don't have these four things, we will never suffer. Number one, we live in the past. Number two, we live in the future. Number three, we like something, we grasp at it. Number four, we don't like something, we push it. Now, you check your mind at this moment, what is happening in your mind? You like something, you want it for yourself, you bring it closer to you. You don't want something, you push it away. And your mind cannot stay still for even one second. It's always oscillating between like and dislike, past and future. Then when you finish your past and your future, you go back to like and dislike. And some say you're in the neutral state. But for how long? Before you, you start wandering again to Paris, to your fridge, to your phone, you always want something. Some of you may already be sleeping. That too is a state of neutral, neutral state work. So when are you going to be aware if you're going to sleep, if you're going to be in the past, if you're going to be in the future, if you're always liking and disliking, and your mind is full of thoughts, when can you live? So gently open your eyes, open your eyes, 
I want you to open your eyes. Okay, now please tell me how many of you saw your mind? Did you see your mind? You saw your mind? What color was your mind? Can you tell me? White color? Black color? Got color? Pink color? What color was your mind? Whose mind had colors? Colors, colorful mind, very beautiful, colorful. Who could touch their mind? Can you touch? Can you touch it? Where is the mind? Did you manage to catch your mind as it was jumping? Could you, could you catch it? Was it jumping? Or was it sitting very still? Was the mind jumping? And when, when your mind jumps, you can, you, can, you, can you catch it? You cannot catch it. Can you taste your mind? Does it have a taste? Is it sweet? Is it sour? What about the smell? Is your mind beautiful smell like the, like the rose petal? Or is it like some rotten carcass stink? What, what is the smell of your mind? So then what is mind? Somebody please tell me. What is the mind? Where is the mind? And, did you, and can you tell me who found out when the mind began? Who could see that when the mind started? The day that you were born, suddenly the mind came, zoom, and then you're alive. Where is your, how did your mind come? Who created your mind? And is your mind your mind? Is your mind and my mind different? Are we, do we have the same mind or different mind? Do you have an individual mind? Everybody got one mind somewhere inside here? You have to find in your body where, where, where? Is it here? Is it here? Where is the mind? So we talk a lot about mind. Now somebody please tell me where is it? For heaven's sakes, I still haven't found out. Tell me where is the mind? Tell me. Now, if you want to meditate, and if you don't know your mind, how are you going to meditate? How can you meditate when you do not even know what is mind? But at, give you chance lah, I give you chance lah. But at least can you feel something? Can you feel your mind? That much can you feel? Did you, did you see? Can you feel the mind? A sad mind, can you feel? A happy mind, can you feel? Can you feel it? Yeah? A heavy mind, very tired mind, can you feel? A very light mind, can you feel? At least you know the difference, isn't it? But can you see the mind? And can you hear the thoughts? Can you hear the thoughts? Sometimes the mind is telling you things. So how many minds do you have? One? Or two? Or three? Hmm? Thousand and one. Thousand and one. That then, then very difficult to meditate if you have a thousand and one minds. <laughs> but it's, 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 sister is correct. It feels like it has a thousand and one mind. It's true. But, that, but fortunately, that's not the case. We don't have that very many minds. But how many do we have? Do you feel that you have... Who says you only have one mind? Okay. Then who was observing the mind just now? You were watching a TV screen of your own mind. So who is watching that mind just now? If you say you only have one mind, then who is, wat who is watching? There, is, there has to be another mind to watch another mind. Two minds. One is sitting down and watching, the other one is the TV. The TV is also the mind. So how many minds? Now we already have two. How many more to go? Can you feel that there are other minds? Or some people, you know, when they say that they, uh, they have ghosts in their body. Have you ever seen some people say that they have ghosts in their body? And then they have multiple personalities. Some they say that they have got... Uh, I heard of a case uh, somewhere, I can't remember where. There were nine, nine uh, different people entered the body at the same time. That means ghosts, uh, no? deceased people. Some people say soul, some people say consciousness. Nine at the same time. And every second the person changes. Sometimes female, sometimes male, sometimes animal, sometimes, you know, sometimes a ghost. Nine different personalities at the same time. 
Am I talking about that? Or am I talking about something else? How is it possible that someone can have nine different consciousnesses enter the body? They say you're possessed by some spirit. And this spirit, nine can enter your body at the same time and, and cause havoc. It has happened before, but nine disturbing the mind at the same time. And then the mind manifests in nine different ways. We are also manifesting in many different ways. When you're angry, who is it? Is it the same person? When you're calm, is it the same person? When you're angry, nobody recognizes you in your family, isn't it? Yeah? What's, what happened to her? Why suddenly so different? It's an angry face. And when you look in the, in the mirror, you, you don't recognize yourself. It's completely different. It's like a ghost that has arisen. Right? And then when you're calm and peaceful and joyful, then when you look at your face in the mirror, it's very beautiful. Isn't it? Is that the same person or different person? The person who was angry and the person who was happy, who is happy and peaceful after meditating. Is it the same mind or different mind? Same. Same mind. So what, what's the difference? Why sometimes the person can be like a ghost, so angry, and another time the person can be like a saint, so peaceful. Sometimes the person can be jealous. Sometimes the person can be so, you know, so good. Sometimes the person can be so stingy, I, my money I don't want to give. Sometimes the person can be so generous, I just give. Emotions, right. So that is correct. So now, I, to make your life easier, I'll give you a, uh, I'll give you the answer. Mind has no shape. Mind has no color. You can, can, mind is not created. No one created the mind. Mind has always been there. So the Buddha said that don't ask the question as to who created the mind and you know, where did the mind come from. If you, were to, if you ask this kind of questions, it is the same as there is a story in uh, the Buddhist sutras. Once there was a person who was shot by an arrow. And then uh, it was a poison arrow. So once the arrow hit the body, then somebody came to help. Said, let me help to take out the arrow. He said, no, please tell me who shot the arrow first. And uh, what is the arrow made of? You know, who, who made the arrow? Where was it made? You know? By the time he asked all these questions, because it was a poison arrow, he died. But he didn't, if the simple thing to do is just take out the arrow, isn't it? Before the poison goes into the body, you take out the arrow and the person will be saved. Somebody is there to save you, but you didn't want, because you wanted to know about where the arrow came from, who shot the arrow, who made the arrow, what is it made of, where was the arrow made. By the time you answer all these questions, your life is already gone. In the same way, the Buddha advised us, don't ask these kind of questions as to where we came from. When was the mind made? When, who created this world? Who and when will the world end? And, and after death, where do we go? The Buddha, where did the Buddha go? All these questions are not relevant, not important. Why? Because don't waste the time. Our life is very, very short. We are in this human life only for maximum. If we are lucky, we live more than 50 years old. Some people die when they are born. Some people die when they are very old. Most of us die in between 30s, 40s, 50s, and we are gone, right? So there is no guarantee. So if we waste our time asking these kind of questions, these kind of metaphysical questions we shouldn't ask. So I'm not going to tell you where the mind was created because the Buddha didn't give us the answer. Who created this? But who created the negative mind? That one I know the answer. Who created the negative? The negative mind and the positive mind, who creates it? Who knows the answer? Hmm? Did, the, did some deva create it or ourselves? So God didn't create, the deva didn't create, yeah? the pretas didn't create, we created our own minds, our own negative mind. And then we blame it. So that's why people who, who believe in God, people who believe in uh, devas and all, they, they say that, you know, uh, God, please help me to make my mind straight. Why did you make me angry, God? Some people will say. Why did you? But actually, the God said, no, I didn't make you angry. You made yourself angry, then you blame it on me, you know? So whenever there's anything bad that happens, people blame. So for monotheists, those who believe in the idea of a creator God, they, be, they say that, uh, some very, 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 those who really don't understand, they say that, you know, 
that God give me all these problems. Actually, these problems do not come from God. These problems come from your own mind. Your own mind. So now you have to understand how many minds you have. So we have how many senses? To understand the mind, we have to understand how many senses we have. We have the physical senses, how many? Which ones? Eyes, ears, nose, taste, and then touch, right? What is the sixth sense? The mind, the mind, the thinking mind, the conceptual mind. Okay, that, those are the six. So we have six, right? And then we have another one that is the emotional mind that can always change. Sometimes angry, sometimes, you know, jealous. So that is one. And then we have an eighth one, number eight. Number eight is a mind that is very deep inside that you cannot find it. That, we call it the true nature of mind. So the one that you are watching, that's not the mind that you are watching. Actually, you are watching your conscious mind, the sixth mind. Right? And who was watching? The one who was watching the mind is actually your true nature of mind. Your, your actual nature of mind arises when you sit down and try to understand, see the drama in your mind. So they say in um, Mahayana Buddhism, we have uh, from this Yogacara school of Mahayana Buddhism, we understand it as uh, Tata Gata Garba. That means it is the Buddha nature. So everybody has the nature of a Buddha. Everybody can become a Buddha. Whether it is, whether it is an ant or a, or a human being or a preta or a asura or a deva, whatever life form, whether it's a, whether it's a cockroach, whether it's a rat, whatever life form, every living being has a Buddha nature. And what is this Buddha nature that we are talking about? So, this is coming from the Mahayana Buddhist perspective, okay? So, from the Mahayana Buddhist perspective, we, we understand it as there is a primordial mind, a mind that has always been around, and it is our own nature. But we are blanketed by this negative mind. We call it this klesas, you know, klesas. So, what are these klesas? The poisons of anger, the three main poisons. Poisons of anger, ha anger and hatred is same. Then number two, attachment. Yeah, and then number three, ignorance. Greed and attachment is same. Lah, you know, the quality of greed is wanting to grab. So attachment is the same, wanting to grab. The quality of hatred is wanting to push. And you know, so if you dislike something, you push. You like something, you you grab. So our mind only does four things actually. If you really look at your mind, you sit down, you watch your mind like you're watching a TV, then you will see that your mind only goes, your mind always goes to, to the past and always goes to the future and your mind always, when you like, you take. When you don't like, you push. That's all we do. We are like animals. Same. We are no different from the animals. But animals are better than us. They don't think about the past. They think only about the food in the future. Meow. Then they ask for food, you know. So they always want to think about the... They don't worry about what happened. So they, they have three. We have four. We, we always keep grudges, you know. Whatever our family did to us, we always keep grudges. We can never let go. The moment somebody says something bad to us, they say it only once to us, but we carry it like a, like a coffin. Everywhere we go for the rest of our lives, we carry. If somebody says you're an idiot once, yeah? Let's say, for example, somebody says, you know, to me, go to hell one time. Remember karma? Go to hell. So I, then I get angry. I said, why this person tell me go to hell? You shouldn't have told me go to hell. This person uh, is so rude to tell me to go to hell. You know, why should I go to hell? Let them go to hell. How many times I've already said it? That person said it once, but in my mind, I said it how many times? Five times at least. And if every day I think about it, from one day, two days, three days, four days, five days, one week, one month, one year, ten years, I would have said it hundreds of times, 
thousands of times go to hell this person told me to go to hell this person told me to go to hell this person told me to go to hell every day you build up build up build up it becomes more and more solid once it becomes more and more solid 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 it becomes habit once it becomes habit it becomes character then we become tragic tragic characters we become angry beings and we become grudge keepers and then we never find happiness and we are always living in the past just because somebody told you to go to hell one time so the, I, the, the thing is that we like to grasp we cannot let go the, we like to grasp at things somebody says one thing bad to us we keep it for life somebody does one thing bad to, to us we keep it for life but why don't we remember that person did so many good things for us let's say for example if we have um, a good friend a good friend maybe has done 100 good things for us but towards the end maybe the good friend says um, said something to hurt us then from that time onwards we say okay the moment you say this out you go from my life and then we forget the hundred good things that the friend has done why because our minds always choose the negative for example if we have a wall there is a wall with a thousand bricks and then if there is one brick that is uh, black if the, we have a white wall there's one brick that is a bit dirty with the, with the paint coming out just one brick your mind will see the 999 white bricks or your mind will see that one black one you tell me which one will you see you will see that black one in the same way when when we have relationships we had friends family we only see that one black brick we do not see that 100 999 good things that people have done for us and therefore, that's why we are not grateful. We do not have that gratitude in our hearts. We always have the attitude that we want to win. If you want to win, then you will see that black one. And you must always win. But guess what? Whenever you keep a grudge, you're the loser. You're not the winner. Winners let go. Losers grasp. So the, we have created this mental habit so strongly that we like something we we grasp, we dislike something, we push. And then living in the past, living in the future, these four things make up our character. And then life after life, we are running, life after life, we are going in automatic mode. We just do things automatically. And the Buddha said, stop. When are we going to stop? So how to stop? So people say, people tell us, we should meditate, right? How to meditate? What to meditate? what is meditation meditation is nothing special meditation is just habituation that's a tibetan word for it my te tibetan teacher is here correct me if i'm wrong is gom right gom means habituation isn't it to habituate so meditation is not about uh going in levitating you know some people say oh if you meditate now you can go up and uh, you, you will, your body will go up and float in the sky or you can walk through wa uh, walls or you can read people's minds meditation is very special people think it's very special and meditation means i can walk on water you know i have superpowers i can what, whatever i wish for will come true in front of me like that that's meditation that's not meditation and that's not a miracle even if i if we have all those powers it's of no use if you get angry even one second what is the use of a power of having all this can read people's minds what is the use of my being able to read somebody's mind if i cannot control my own anger shame on me isn't it so then why are we here what what is our primary purpose of of our human life why do we have to study the dharma and why the buddha asks us to meditate why because the buddha knows he knew that we have this mind full of poisons and and he knew that we are in automatic mode and he knew that we don't have the remote control actually we have it but we don't know that we have it so what to do so the buddha explained this is your mind your mind has no shape your mind has no color and your mind is actually naturally very peaceful your mind and the buddha's mind my mind and your mind are the same the cat's mind, the cockroach mind, everybody's mind is the same. As long as you have life and a good degree of sentience, you, can, you are aware, you are, you are able to think, you are a sentient being. And all beings, sentient beings have the same mind. We all have the Buddha nature. So the Buddha said, everybody can become a Buddha. 
It's not only you have to worship me. He said, I am. I came into this world to teach you how to be your your own Buddha. Don't worship me. You, if you worship me, you can. You will not become enlightened. But if you practice what I teach you, you will become enlightened. Don't think of me as a god and and worship me. That's not why we 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 pay respect to the Buddha. We pay respect to the Buddha because he taught us how to become free, how to be free from our own minds, how to understand our own minds. The Buddha was a scientist. And Buddhism is science. It's the science of mind. Anybody who studies Buddhism will understand that Buddhism is a science of mind. It's a way of life. It's ahimsa, not to harm any other person. That is Buddhism. That means, as a practicing Buddhist, it's not the label that's important, oh, I am Buddhist. It's not about that. It's how much you train your mind. That is a Buddhist. How much you can see your mind in a scientific way. That is a Buddhist. It's not how many hours you meditate every day. It's how many people you benefit every day. That is a Buddhist. How many, how many lives can you actually change through your own actions? Don't change other people. Change yourself. So the Buddha said that if you want to be happy, first, do good. Number, sorry, avoid evil. Number two, do good. Number three, train your mind. Purify the mind. So now I tell you how to do good. How to, how to, sorry, how to purify, uh, how to uh, stop becoming, uh, having bad thoughts. To, to stop having bad thoughts, you must know that you have bad thoughts. Why we have bad thoughts is because of our five senses. When we like something, we hear something that we like, we immediately grasp, right? And if we don't get it, what happens? If there's something that comes in front of us, nice music, and if we don't get it, what happens? We get angry. Isn't it? And if there is something that we don't like, the sound, somebody is coughing, somebody is sneezing, somebody is drilling, we immediately dislike. Do you know that when we dislike something, we create karma? The energy of hate, that means the energy hate, I don't like, I don't like, that creates karma. The moment you have a thought, I don't like something, you create karma. And the moment you have a thought that I like something, you create karma. Like create karma, don't like also create karma. And how, and how intense is your karma depends how much you want it. If you like somebody, you want that person so much, and if you don't get that person, you get angry. Isn't it? So actually, anger is coming from attachment. Attachment is the worst one. The worst is attachment. That means you want something. If you get it, okay. If you get it today, then tomorrow you want more. Then tomorrow you get it, then you want the third day you must get it again. The fourth day you must get it again. Like drugs, same thing. Today you eat a little bit, tomorrow you want more, you want more. Actually speaking, everything in our life is like a drug. Whether it's good food, everything is like a drug. You want more, you want more, you want more. Right? You love your children and you want to see them every day. So you want more, you want more, you want more, you want more, you want more. If you have somebody that you love, today you see, tomorrow you don't see. Today you see, you're happy. Tomorrow you see, you get more attached. The day after you see, you get more attached. The fourth day you don't see, you get angry. So which is the worst, which is the worst, worst mental poison? The worst one is attachment. Because attachment can, can, can go in two ways only. One, you get more attached. When you get more and more attached, you grasp, you start to grasp at it. Then you start to crave and you start to grasp. Very strong grasping at something creates very strong karma. If you get something, then from attachment, you want something but you don't get something, then that attachment turns to aversion, it turns to hatred. So that is the second poison. When you don't get something, or you get something that you don't want, like somebody gives you a horrible sound, drilling sound, or bad smell, cat smell, cat shit smell, or you know, dog poop, or horrible smell, whatever, you know, smoke smell. When that kind of smell comes, and it touches your nose, you get angry. Because you don't like it, and you push it. So we, every single second of our life, is some, whether you like or you don't like. You like or you don't like. You like or you don't like. If you like, you want more. If you don't like, you push. The whole life you're doing that, day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out, how much karma you create. That's why we are born, reborn again. So how to stop creating this karma? It's very important. Are you aware that your mind is working like that? 
Are you aware? Do you know that that's how your mind operates? That the moment you want something, you want it more. And then when you don't get it, you get angry. Do you, are you aware? But, but you still do it. So that means you're not aware. You're aware only a certain people, you're not fully aware. If you're fully aware, you won't become angry at all. That is full awareness. That is a Buddha. You won't get angry at all. So it's very simple. But why are we not aware? Because of one more poison. That one poison is called ignorance. So at the end of the day, the Buddha taught us that ignorance, avidya. Avidya means without knowledge, no knowledge, don't understand. We don't understand what? Avidya means, we, in Pali we say avidya, isn't it? So avidya means, that means you don't know. That means we are in automatic mode. We don't know that we are alive. We don't know when we brush our teeth. We don't know when we are actually walking to the car. When we drive, everything is automatic. We actually, we don't know anything. We are always in automatic mode. That is avidya, uh, ignorance. And it is because of that that we create karmas. If we are aware, then we won't create those karmas, isn't it? We are always in automatic mode. That's why we create those karmas. How many of us can, are aware at every moment that our, mind are, uh, our minds are actually pulling? When we like something, we pull. When we don't like something, we push. How many of us are aware that our minds we are actually in the past and in the future? How many of us are aware that we do these four things in the mind? How many of us are aware? Are we really aware? We are not aware. And that is ignorance. So which is the worst? Is it ignorance, attachment? Or, or anger which is the worst poison we have three poisons three mental poisons which is the worst one why is ignorance the worst why is avidya worse than anger why is avidya worse than uh, attachment why because if you knew you won't do it isn't it you will do something about it so now you know how your mind works because the Buddha's teaching has reached your ears now. Now you know. So now the Buddha is telling you, now you know, what are you going to do? Now please, scientifically now, how are you going to do it? How are you going to purify your mind? You have to reprogram your mind. It's like a computer programming. You have a bad program, you have to reinstall. So we have a bad program now. We have, a bad, we have some viruses. We have three viruses of ignorance, attachment and anger. Three viruses. So these three viruses, how to reprogram our minds? So reprogramming the mind is meditation. Meditation is nothing to do with walking on the air or whatever it is. Reprogramming the mind is very scientific. Meditation is science. Science of mind is meditation. Meditation is nothing supernatural. It's nothing special. It's just very ordinary. And if you think it's special, then you will never be able to meditate. But if you understand meditation as a science, as a training, you will be able to meditate. Okay, so how to meditate, how to reprogram the mind, it's very easy. Every day, five minutes, you sit down, before you get out of, of bed, you look at your mind and then you see whether you're, you're going to the past or you're going to the future. And then when you get angry, you see whether you are, your mi no, when you see your mind, if you're going to get angry, you see how your mind is pushing. You can feel the mind pushing, you can feel it. And if you're getting attached, you like something, you want something, you can feel your, your mind, your, your heart is actually gra grasping. Can you do that? These four things. Every morning you wake up, you start your day with this. Just five minutes you sit and you watch the TV of your mind. So that, so that TV of your mind you must watch. And when you watch... When you watch, the more you watch, the power becomes less. So we say that some people say, when I watch my mind, it becomes more. Initially, it becomes more. When your thoughts become more and more when you first start to watch your mind. But our minds have only the same. Everything in this world arises, it stays for a while, then it goes away. So first, the anger will come. The anger will come. It will come, woof, it will come like that. And then when you watch, when you apply the mindfulness, the awareness, when you look, you watch your mind, you just watch. Your job is just to watch. When you really watch your mind, 
You can see it, the volcano coming out, this anger, you can feel it, you can feel it. It's so annoying, it's, you can't control it, you feel. Just don't do anything, just sit down, and watch your mind. And then when that anger comes, you, you watch, it will come, it's got three things in the anger. It will rise, it will stay for a short while, and if you, if you watch it, then it will disappear. It's like that. It just arises, it stays for a short while and it disappears. And then the attachment also. If you like something so much, hold on, hold on. Just stop. See how your mind reacts. It, it goes up, it stays for a short while, and then it disappears. Everything in life is like that, isn't it? When we breathe also, we breathe in, it goes, and then it stays for a short while, and then it comes out. Everything in life is like that. Everything is impermanent. Everything is changing. So if you just, we say shining the torch of your mind, shining a torch on your mind the torch of awareness you shine on your mind all you have to do is look at your mind and see your mind and when these negative emotions come all you have to do let's say for example you're stressed you're so stressed you don't know what to do you're so angry you don't know what to do you're so jealous you don't know what to do at that moment you just sit down and then you watch it like a tv and then you can see that it is coming, it's coming, it's coming. Sometimes it gets worse and worse. It will go very high, very, very strongly. It will go, 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 up, 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 until it reaches a certain point. Then suddenly you see it starts to stabilize. This anger is suddenly stabilized. And then the more you watch it like a TV, zoom, it disappears. And where does it come? It comes from our own mind, anger. It's not somebody is making us angry. Don't blame other people for making us angry. Don't blame other people for making us jealous. Don't blame other people for making us attached. We have the three poisons from the beginning. So nobody, we cannot blame anybody actually in this world. We always do. I have the tendency to blame. I admit it because of lack of mindfulness. So if I really understand my mind, I will just sit down quietly and when something happens, I know that it's because I have not purified my own mind. The anger is there. The attachment is there. Because I am ignorant. If I have wisdom, I won't become angry so fast. I won't become jealous so fast. I won't become uh, greedy so fast. So how? So daily you practice. Day, when you practice meditation daily, it, the intensity, the energy of your anger goes down. It, one day, two days cannot. But you have to be consistent. You know, it will slowly go down. So the next time you get angry, before you, you open your mouth to hurt other people, you will know that it is just going up. You see the energy going up, you see it stabilize, and you see it go down. So we call it arising, abiding, and seizing. It will arise, it will stay, and it will go. So that is how we have to practice. So before we go out and beat up somebody, so when we meditate every day for five minutes, we see our minds, sometimes we get so sad, sometimes we get so angry. Sadness also, the sadness will go up and then it will go very high. Then but your job is just to watch. It's like you're shining a torchlight on your mind. When you shine your torchlight, of your, you are aware, you shine it on your mind, it, you can see it going up. It becomes more and more energetic. It, it becomes like a volcano. It goes up, 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 up. You, sometimes you think that it will, it's like going to burst. It will never burst. If you keep quiet and sit down, it won't burst. You won't become crazy because you're shining the torch of wisdom on your mind. So it will go up to a certain, it cannot go higher than that already. Then it will, it will stabilize. Once it stabilizes, it will fizzle up. So the anger written is actually empty. There's no such thing as anger. It's, you know, have you heard of shunyata before? Shunya? It doesn't exist. The anger doesn't exist. There is no anger, there is no ignorance. We think that there is an anger. We think that there is somebody who is angry. We always think that me, I have me, this is me, you know, me, me. I am karma children, me, myself and I. If I tell you that I don't exist the way you think I do, because actually speaking, all I'm doing, the reason why we get angry, now I have to tell you, why we are getting, why we have these three poisons. We have these three poisons because we think that we are truly existing. That there is a real karma children here. Actually, if you cut my body, 
You cannot find which part of my body says I'm karma children. Where is the label? It's just a label. When I was born, I came into this world and I'm changing all the time. The body that I have when I was born and now is different. Every day, our body cells are changing, changing. How can you say that it is the same person? Every day, the person is changing. The blood is changing. After six months, completely different blood. And every single moment, my thoughts are changing. So we, we think that the human being, that, every, that we, we are actually concretely existing, that there is a person that, yes, this is karma children. This is not karma children. Because if this is karma children, I must remain the same. But because I am impermanent, I change. All the time I'm changing. So I, I am just a label. There is no real person sitting down here that you can grasp at. But I think there is. So I have this very strong sense of I. The moment you have this very strong sense of I, you want to, then you feel that I am getting angry, I am getting attached, and you get very excited about I. It's me. But if you really look at it, our nature of our mind, our existence, that we are all impermanent, we are always changing, and we are all built up of smaller little things. We are made up of what? We say we are made up of the five aggregates. We are rupa, our body is rupa, then vedana, feelings, perceptions, sanya, mental factors, the, ha the habitual sankara, and then number five is our consciousness. So these five aggregates, rupa, vedana, the feelings, Sanya, perception, sanskara, the mental formations, and vinyana, the consciousness, this is what you are. This is what, come together is what you are. And then we are made up of what? Five elements, earth, water, fire, wind, space. And if that disintegrates, now where is you? Can, where are you? When, you? when we die, you don't bring your body along. So is the body you? And then you don't, and then your mind migrates to another body, right? Can you see your mind? So where are you? Who are you? Who am I? We, we so tightly grasp that this body is mine. This body is not mine. This mind is mine. This soul is mine. What, what do you mean by soul? There is no permanent soul. Everything is changing. Everything is empty. There is nothing in this world that you can grasp at. Nothing whatsoever. But we like to attach we, we want to have this self-identity and we get angry when somebody wants to take away this self-identity. We have this idea of protection. We must protect our own self. So when we create an I, when you create an I, we create an other, isn't it? Once you create yourself, surely the, the natural is that others arise, isn't it? You cannot be living alone in this world. So that's why all the wars in this world, all the conflicts, all the religious wars, all the conflicts in this world, one country fighting another, it is me versus you. I versus you. So it is my religion versus your religion. It is my people versus your people. And where did this idea come from? This idea came from this ego. There is such something called an ego. An ego is actually nothing other than the ignorance. The ignorance thinks that there is a real being there, that there is a truly existing person by the name of karma children. And this karma children is very great, very clever, very, very, what they call that, fantastic. I think like that. So the moment I think myself as fantastic, then others are nothing. So that's exactly how we are. So the moment we think that we are great, we look down on others. If we understand that we actually are empty, just shunya, nothing, we, we are consistently changing. Where is karma children? If I, where? My tongue, my, my head, my body, my blood. Which is karma children? If I cannot even find karma children, so who am I? So who is this person that is giving this dharma talk, this great person, you know, who's sitting on this great throne here? Who is giving this dharma talk? Please tell me there is no one. It's not the way I, the way I, there is somebody here, but this somebody is not permanent. It's going to die someday. And this somebody is constantly changing and it's just a label. So if you attach so much to this I, then you will be more angry. You will become more and more arrogant. You will become more and more possessive. And you become more and more jealous because this is, you think that you truly exist. And once you make yourself exist, you will make another group. So you like to make two groups, isn't it? We call it duality. We have two things. Once we make 
Let's say, for example, we have one religion. Let's say, for example, we are Buddhists. So then, there has to be non-Buddhists, isn't it? But if there is no Buddhists, then how? Then there is no non-Buddhists also. So why worry about whether we are Buddhists or not Buddhists? If we have white, we must have black. If we have right, we must have left. You know? But actually speaking, it is this mind that likes to split A versus B, I versus you. You know? This versus that. If we have black, must have white. If we have tall, must have short. All these things are dualistic things in our mind. It's all created because of the sense that we have a sense of I. We have this sense that if I exist, somebody else must exist. So then we have we, our group, our cultural group, we versus you. So Buddhists versus non-Buddhists, Muslims versus non-Muslims. So there is actually in this reality, there is no such thing. Everything is like a, everything is empty. There is nothing in this world that truly exists the way we think we do. I'm not saying it doesn't exist at all. It exists. But the way it exists is we think of it as concrete. It's not concrete. It's always changing. And it is made of small little parts. We cannot see the parts. When we look at a human body, we don't see the parts. But if you look at a human body and see the parts, we don't want to go near to that human body. It's disgusting, isn't it? But we don't see it. We see only as, as one particular entity and then we, we attach. That is the whole problem. So this self-identity, the, the stronger the sense of self, the greater the mental poisons. So how? How to come out of this? So how to dwell in your true nature of mind? What is our true nature of mind? Every day, wake up in the morning, understand these four things. Past, our mind goes to the past, our mind goes to the future. I like this, I don't like that. And every day, try to live in the present moment. You breathe in, you understand that you're breathing in. And breathing out, we understand that I'm breathing out. In and out. Come, let's try, five minutes. So if you want to be free from this idea of self, that there is a me, because of me, I create this ignorance. This ignorance is, this ignorance is actually telling me that I exist. But actually speaking, I don't exist the way I think I do. I exist depending on causes and conditions. If there is food, I exist. If, if somebody doesn't feed me, I'll die. If there's oxygen, I exist. If somebody doesn't, if there is no more oxygen, I will die. So I'm not permanent. I exist because of causes and conditions. When those causes and conditions are gone, I will not exist anymore in this form. I will move on. I may become a tree. I'll become a flower. Why attach to this identity? When we are always changing, understand that and let go, let go of this I, this great sense of self. It's a deception, it's not really true. But our ignorance will make us stay in samsara forever. Our ignorance, we think that it's ours, actually is nothing to do with our at, at anger. Anger doesn't belong to us, attachment doesn't belong to us, and neither does ignorance belong to us, it's just there. Once you understand that it doesn't belong to you because there is no you, then you, you are liberated. And again, you feel, just imagine that you're looking at the beautiful bright sky. Tell yourself, breathing in, I'm aware that I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I'm aware that I'm breathing out. In and out. So be very aware of the breathing in and out. And be very well aware of your thoughts. Are your thoughts going to the past? Are your thoughts going to the future? Are your thoughts liking something, grasping, or are your thoughts disliking something? Every day of our lives, we live our lives going outside. We like sounds, we like taste, everything, every experience we are going outside, 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 outside. All our experiences are outside of ourselves. Come back home. Come home. The Buddha said, come home. How to come home? How to come back to your true nature of mind? Don't project ourselves outwards. Outside is not where. We can never be free if we are always outside. Our minds must come back inside. And how to come back inside? Live in the present moment. How to live in the present moment? Learn how to observe nature. Learn how to be one with your breath. So breathing in, I'm aware that I'm breathing in. I know 
I'm breathing in, breathing out, I know that I'm breathing out. And you breathe out, you breathe in and out very nicely. And just stay with your breath. Ground yourself with your breath. And your breath will take you to your true nature of mind. Your breath is the anchor to your mind, your, your Buddha nature. Your Buddha nature is now stained. It's like, the, it's like you, you look at the sky, a beautiful blue sky but many clouds. And you cannot see the blue sky because too many clouds. And those clouds are your ignorance. Those clouds are your attachment. Those clouds are your anger. If you just observe your breath, slowly, slowly those clouds will disappear and your mind will become one with the sky. Because your mind is the sky. Your mind is not the clouds. The clouds are just temporary. The Buddha said that the anger, attachment and ignorance are temporary. It's not you. What is you? Who are you? You are the sky. You are nature. You are the wind. You are the sun. You are everything. Feel nature and you can feel your Buddha nature. No more going to the past. No more going to the future. Stop projecting your mind outwards. I like this sound. I like that sound. Understand that liking and disliking will bring you away from your, from your true nature of mind and create a lot of negative karma. Just relax, come back to your breath. When you're tired, when you want to rest your mind, come back to your breath. Tell yourself, breathing in, I'm aware that I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I'm aware that I'm breathing out. In, out. In, out. Breathing in, I'm aware that I'm breathing in. Breathing out, I'm aware that I'm breathing out. In, out. So when you breathe like this, five minutes every morning, just ground yourself in your breath. Just breathe and enjoy your breath. Don't think about the past. Don't think about the future. If you think, then just observe your mind like a TV. Don't stop your thinking don't force yourself to stop your thinking just watch your mind like you're watching tv and slowly that mind will calm down and the anger will disappear just watch it watch your attachment and the attachment will disappear if you're sleepy understand this one trick if you're sleepy close your eyes sit down quietly breathe in i'm aware that i'm breathing in Breathing out, I'm aware that I'm breathing out. If you are sleepy, watch your mind and see where the sleep is coming from. The sleep will come from somewhere, from the corner. You will become very sleepy. Your whole body will become fully sleepy. And then you become more and more sleepy and become higher and higher and higher, sleepy, sleepy, sleepy. And then, because you're looking, you're watching your mind with a torch of wisdom, suddenly, the sleep just disappears. If you have some pain in your body, if you have very bad headache, if you have a very bad neck ache or leg pain, and your mind is telling you, I very pain, it's very pain, it's very pain, I don't want this pain, I don't want this pain. Now don't tell your mind, now stop telling you don't want this pain. Say, pain, come. You are my friend, I love you, pain. Please come. I don't, I'm not angry with you, pain. Come. Let me look at you, pain. Let me see your face. Oh, neck pain. Oh, back pain. Come. I want to see your face. Let me see the pain. And look at the pain. And look at the pain and feel where is the pain coming from. Feel it. And look at it. The pain will become more. It will become more. It will become more. Until such a time, it will, it will stop. It will stabilize and the pain will disappear. I guarantee you that your pain will disappear. Meditation is like, is like tranquilizer, it's like taking Waltron, it's like taking painkiller. If you observe your pain like this, your pain will completely disappear. If you observe your sleep, it will completely disappear. 
if you observe your anger which is not yours actually pain is not yours it's just pain when you observe pain it will disappear when you observe anger it will disappear it's not your anger it's not your pain if you say it's your pain it will, you will always be pain in pain but you just say pain is a friend it's not me it's my friend come i invite you to come have tea with the pain come tea come pain have tea with me come sit down let's discuss and then you look at the pain with love look at the pain with love don't say i don't want you pain you are here come i accept you i accept the pain once you accept your pain once you accept that you're angry you you have anger once you accept don't feel sad that you have anger everybody has anger don't push it away just observe it don't have any hate hateful thoughts towards your anger don't belittle yourself don't say i'm useless i have anger oh i have a lot of pain i'm useless i'm miserable i'm weak no you can change your mind is very powerful so when you have anger it's not your anger observe your mind observe like watching tv shine the torch on your mind wherever you have anger see where it's coming from how it becomes more and more and more until it wants to explode then then it stabilizes and disappears pain too observe more and more pain become more pain becomes more it's not my pain let go and it will disappear sleep look at the sleep it becomes more and more and more and more and more until suddenly it disappears and your mind is fully awake so that is the power of your mind and once you can once you are in the present moment bit by bit every day you bring back the remote control into your life do things slowly learn how to walk a little bit slowly learn how to eat slowly learn how to get up slowly from your meditation cushion get out of bed slowly feel the movement of your leg on the floor when you eat feel the food in your mouth when you breathe feel the breath in your nostril when you drink feel the water on your tongue everything that you do you do it fully fully aware just be one with whatever that you do if you can be one with your breath be one with the pain be one with the anger be one with the birds be one with the sky be one with the jungle the plants the whatever the water whatever phenomena if you can just merge your mind in that and remain in the present moment at that moment you achieve a mini buddhahood you become a small buddha if every second of the day you, your mind becomes stronger and stronger your awareness becomes stronger and stronger and you your you feel that you are one with the world you feel so connected to everything you feel that you are the tree you are the mountain you are the breath if you are not separate from from the, your christian friend or you are not separate from the other animals you are them they are you our we are of one nature we are one we are one we are not separate that everybody has a buddha nature and everybody's everybody is one go deeper and deeper into your heart you can feel your heart opening up now you go deeper and deeper you can only become more and more deeper and connected if you are slow watch your mind learn how to listen to the sound of the birds listen to your heart go slow breathe in i'm aware that i'm breathing in breathing out i'm aware that i'm breathing out open your ears and listen there are birds chirping outside feel the air conditioning touch your skin live every moment in pure full awareness the present moment is the only moment no past no future relax let go let go of the past let go of the future let go of liking something let go of disliking something just let go there is no pain there is no permanent pain there is no permanent anger there is no permanent ignorance there is no permanent self and just rest in this space 
Rest your mind in this space. Go deeper and deeper in your mind. Rest in the space. Merge your mind with the vast clouds, vast sky. Imagine that there's a blue sky, beautiful dark blue, beautiful blue sky. Rest your mind in that. Take another two minutes and just rest. Rest your mind. Your mind is so tired from the day you're born until now, non-stop, talking, talking, doing, doing. Rest. Just rest. Merge your mind with the sky and feel your heart open up. Now you can hear all the sounds of the birds. Your heart is becoming warmer and warmer, opening up more and more. You are starting to smile. You've become more relaxed and your mind has completely merged with the sky. You are one with nature. That is the experience of Buddha nature. That is the experience of Buddhahood. No more past, no more future, just here and now. Just enjoying every second, every sound you enjoy. There's nothing wrong in enjoying. There's only something wrong when you cannot let go, when you grasp. That is the problem. To enjoy a beautiful bird sound is the experience of Buddha. Rest your mind. Rest. Merge your mind with the sky and slowly open your eyes. Okay. Feel something different? What can you feel something? What did you feel? Something? Something different? What was different? Very peaceful. Did you actually feel that you became one with the world, with the universe? At a, just even for two seconds, it's just a split second you became one with the sky. Yes or no? Yes? That is the experience of Buddhahood. That is enlightenment. That is heaven or hell, whatever people will say. Yeah, That is the experience of heaven. That is the experience of enlightenment. That is freedom. That is liberation from samsara. Liberation from your own mental poisons is liberation from samsara. When you know how to merge your mind with nature and learn to live in the present moment, you are one step closer to Buddhahood. So with this, I thank you. So we will dedicate the merits. My apologies, I took a little bit more time, but I thought everybody was in the mood. So I just wanted you all to experience your true nature of mind. And if somebody were to ask you, what is true nature of mind? It's the experience of living in the present moment. Your mind is now. Whatever that you experience without going to the past, without going to the future, without grasping, when you let go and you merge your mind with the universe, that is your true nature of mind. Okay? With this, we dedicate the merits. Very, uh, I will just make a short invocation and then just understand that uh, whatever positive energy that you collected now, you must share it with everybody. Don't keep it for yourself. There are so many billions and billions of beings in this world who are suffering. Now we have to channel this energy to them. Right? We must be... It's science, yeah? We have more energy, so we have to share. So that is the law of equilibrium, isn't it? We cannot just keep it for ourselves. So I will just uh, do a chanting in Tibetan very quickly. Sunam di tam Ni top ni ni pedra nam pam jene Giga na ji balab droba Ye tit bed so le droba droba shok Jampe ba wo jitara ken ba Da kuntu zang po de yan de jin de Deta kungi jesu dalo 
ชุบาริโชลามาคุคามจังลาสอลวาเดชุตุกุเซริงลาสอลวาเดพริเลตะชิงกิลาสอลวาเดลามาตันรวามิบายจิงกิโลชาเซวาตันจุจิงชาปา